Section 28.3, the relativity of time, time dilation. And just as some foreshadowing here, time dilation actually is a hint at what effect we're going to observe here, right? Dilation, you can imagine when your pupils, if your eyes get dilated, if that even still happens anymore, right? Where, well, it certainly does when you are in a dark room, right? Your pupils get really big so that you can take more light in. They've become dilated. And we're going to see that same effect as another consequence of the speed of light being our only true constant in all reference frames. So in order to observe this, we're going to need something known as a light clock. So the light clock has a light source that sends a little light pulse, right? A little flash. That light pulse travels up to a mirror, reflects off the mirror, and comes back down to the detector. When the detector detects the light pulse, it gives a little tick on the chart recorder. And so then you can measure the distance between the ticks, and that's going to correspond to the distance that the light has to travel. Now we could set this experiment up where we set up this light clock on a spaceship with an astronaut, where the astronaut can measure the time it takes for the light to travel up to the mirror and back down to the detector, where it's going this distance d but twice, so 2d. And so the astronaut could measure some time that that would take delta t naught or delta t zero. Interestingly though, it looks different if you have an outside observer on Earth, right? Because on Earth, they're able to see that the astronaut is flying through the air at a pretty significant velocity. And so the light isn't just going straight up and down, the light now has to travel in this long diagonal path to go up to the mirror and come back down to the detector. So an observer on Earth will see the light pulse travel a greater distance. Now we know light can't suddenly start traveling faster to make up for the greater distance. And so the result is that the observer on Earth will see time dilate. They measure a time that's a greater than what the astronaut observes because the light has to travel this greater distance. And so the time that the Earth observer would measure is known as just delta T, no subscript. And it's equal to that the, the astronaut would measure, delta T naught, divided by the square root of one minus the speed that the astronaut is going squared divided by the speed of light squared. Now these times are really important. And it's one of the trickiest parts with these problems is figuring out which time is which. So the delta T naught is known as the proper time interval. That's the time interval that's measured at rest with respect to the clock. So that's something you want to hold on to. And in general, this is a good rule of thumb, the proper time interval between events is the time interval measured by an observer who is at rest relative to the events. So the astronaut is at rest relative to the light traveling up and down versus the Earth observer looking at the astronaut flying by sees that relative motion or is moving relative to the astronaut and the clock. So because the astronaut is right with the clock, moving at the same rate as it, the astronaut's at rest relative to the clock and is able to measure this proper time interval. So let's get some numbers with this so it's a little bit less abstract because this is a lot of terminology to throw around. So first we'll stick with this astronaut example. The spacecraft is moving past the Earth at a constant speed of 0.92 times the speed of light. Whew, super fast. The astronaut measures the time interval between ticks of the spacecraft clock to be 1.0 seconds. What is the time interval that an Earth observer measures? Now we remember, okay, the astronaut's traveling through space, so they should, right with the clock, so they should measure a shorter time. The Earth observer sees the light going a greater distance, so they should measure a longer time because time is dilated. And so we can double check this, right? If, if the astronaut can measure the proper time, delta T naught, and then we have the speed that the spacecraft is moving is 0 0.92 times C, the speed of light. So if we plug those into our equation for the time dilation, we have 
the astronaut's proper time interval, 1.0 seconds, divided by the square root of 1 minus 0.92c divided by c. And there it's really convenient to not multiply the c out because as you can see, they cancel. And so we just end up with 0.92 squared and then negative added to the 1. Make sure to remember to square that. So what we end up with is that the observer measures that light pulse taking 2.6 seconds. That's more than double the time that the astronaut measured. It's wild. Let's look at one more example. The physics of space travel and special relativity. Alpha Centauri, a nearby star in our galaxy, is 4.3 light years away. That means that as measured by a person on Earth, it would take light 4.3 years to reach this star. If a rocket leaves for Alpha Centauri and travels at a speed of V equals 0.95 C relative to the Earth, by how much will the passengers have aged according to their own clock when they reach their destination? Assume that the Earth and Alpha Centauri are stationary with respect to each other. Right. So there's a bit of interpretation here, right, in that we, we first have the speed that the rocket's traveling at, 0.95 C. That's already in a great form. The 4.3 light years is an interesting one because this is actually a distance even though it doesn't seem like it might be because years we think of with time. But to illustrate this, we can go to our definition of distance, that distance is just velocity times time. And this is talking about light years. So we take the speed of light times the time, 4.3 years, and we get 4.3 C years or light years. So this is actually in fact a distance. Now, it's not yet a time of how long our spaceship would actually take to get there because this tells us how long it takes light to travel there, but no spaceship is able to travel at the speed of light. And this one, even though it's very close to the speed of light is not quite at the speed of light. So if we solve for the time that as viewed from earth, how long it takes to travel this distance, delta T is just distance divided by speed. And so the distance is 4.3 C uh, years, light years, divided by 0 0.95 C. The C's cancel and we end up with a time that's slightly greater than 4.3 because we aren't traveling quite as fast as the speed of light. So it's going to take a little bit more time. Where things get really wild though is when we consider what the astronauts would observe. The astronauts, remember, are at rest relative to the spaceship. So they're measuring the proper time interval, which means they aren't measuring the dilated time, they're measuring a shorter time. So if you rearrange to solve for their proper time that the astronauts would measure, it would be the original time of how long it takes as viewed from Earth times the square root of one minus the speed squared divided by C squared. And what we find for this when you do the math out is that the proper time, what the astronauts would observe, is only 1.4 years have traveled, have gone by. So somehow they've cut three years off of the trip compared to what Earth observes. This is really wild stuff. It's where physics gets weird. Um, yeah, and there's all kinds of things out there on the twin paradox. There's a few videos in the slides if you want to check those out. That's a fun avenue to explore. But one tip I have, if you're trying to distinguish between dilated time and proper time, is just remember, if you move fast enough, time effectively slows down. That less time will pass if you are moving super, super fast. So it's a goal. I haven't ever managed to move fast enough, but it's something you can hold on to as you're thinking this through.